Welcome back friends, my name is Brian and I am not back in the garage again today. Today, I am at our airplane hangar in Pearland, Texas where my wife and I keep our 1965 Piper Cherokee 180. And today I'm gonna to go over an oil change on the Lycoming IO360 motor. Now, this motor is in so many general aviation aircraft, it is just staggering. It's of course in the Piper, it's also in the, the uh, Cessna 172, Mooney M20. I mean, this thing has been in so many different aircraft, it's unbelievable. So even if you don't have a Cherokee, you can use these procedures on your plane. The accessory housing, which is located behind the motor where the magnetos are housed, is different from plane to plane, so your oil filter mounting may be slightly different, but essentially the procedure is exactly the same. Now, one thing you need to keep in mind is that you need to be an owner and a pilot in order to do this procedure on your own plane. Now, if you don't meet that criteria, you can have the job overseen by an AP mechanic. And actually, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm still working on my private uh, license and I have an AP mechanic who's been overseeing this job. But if you watch my channel, you probably know I can manage an oil change without too much trouble. Anyway, with all that, I think that's about all I got. So let's pick up some tools, go to work. Start by removing the cowling in order to gain access to the oil filter, oil filter spout, and the oil drain. Most service advice recommends warming the motor to an operating temperature first. Now, I don't like to do it this way because I don't like to work on hot motors, so my approach was just to leave the oil to drain for several hours. Once you can access the drain plug, fit an appropriate size three or four foot section of tubing to the end of the drain fitting. Push up on the drain fitting and rotate it clockwise until it stops. Obtain a sample for oil analysis about midway through the draining process. Once the oil has drained completely, return the oil release fitting to the closed and locked position. Next is the filter removal, which depending on the accessory housing could be different on your IO360. Remove the safety wire. Place a rag under the filter mounting base. Break the filter seal using a suitably sized wrench. Then slide a plastic bag over the filter. Spin the filter off while trying to contain the oil inside the plastic bag. Finally, wipe the face of the oil filter mount using a clean rag. All right, cowling's off, oil is out. We got a sample to go to Blackstone. We come back, I'm gonna go over the procedures for evaluating your oil filter and then sending your sample off for oil analysis. So hang with me, be right back. All right, so I'm back at my shop and here I wanna go over the process of getting into your filter so you can examine it for metal particles. Now, there's some fun stuff to go over here. The first one is, a, a Lycoming, at least on mine, the accessory housing calls for this filter, which has this male threaded boss at the end, okay? So that is protruding out from the bottom of the filter, a little bit unusual and different than you might find on a car filter. Now, to get into this filter, you're gonna need a special cutting tool like this one. Now, I found this one on Amazon and it's relatively inexpensive, however, in order to make it work with that male threaded boss, I had to cut a one inch diameter hole in the tool. So if you wanna use this inexpensive tool, you're gonna to have to do a little bit of cutting. Now, you can buy this uh, special tool from Tempest, but it's about $150. So it's significantly more expensive than the one that I'm gonna share with you uh, from Amazon, both of which I'm gonna have links for in the description box below. So that's about it. So let me go over the process now of how to get into this filter using this cutter. The process is very similar to using a can opener. Start by fitting the tool over the oil filter base, then dial the cutter until it engages the outer housing of the filter. Rotate the tool around the filter, and with each pass around the filter, progressively tighten the cutter. After a few rotations, you'll cut through the outer housing. Remove the tool, then remove the filter base, and finally the filter element. 
All right, the next step is removing the filter media from the core. Now, what you gotta do in order to do this process is locate this metal band that runs up and down across the core tube. And from there, take something like this box cutter and cut around the circumference of the filter media on both sides. Then make a transverse cut along the metal binding strip, then pull the first fold of media out. After that, it's just some elbow grease to remove all the filter elements from the core. All right, there's a couple of ways that you can go through the media in order to inspect it for metal particles. The most common way is for someone to take a magnet basically and go through each one of these folds, basically running the magnet across each of them, seeing if any kind of metal particles get picked up. Now, I don't like to do it that way because it's greasy and slimy and I just don't wanna do it that way. There's a better way in my opinion, which is to take the media and soak it in fuel. Now to do this, you need a suitable container and basically you drop the filter media into the container with the fuel shake it a few times, and then for me, I basically shook this three or four times over the course of about an hour. Using this technique, any heavy metal particles should settle at the bottom of the can. And in fact, you probably could put a magnet because my can was made of steel at the bottom to pull down any magnetic particles into the bottom of the can. But anyway, after you're done soaking this, pull the element out and then set it aside for now. Strain the contents of the fuel filter container into another container while pouring it through some sort of strainer like the shop paper towel or some cheesecloth. Then inspect the container inside using a magnet to look for any pieces of loose metal. Fortunately on mine all that had settled were some very fine particles of metal that you would expect from any kind of normal use. Next, check the straining media for any noteworthy particles, and again, thankfully, nothing in mind. Finally, visually inspect the media just to be sure that there's no embedded metal particles in there, and thankfully, again, once again, my filter was free from any noticeable metal particles. With the filter carefully evaluated, the oil container is now ready for a trip to the auto parts store and for proper disposal. All right, so now that the filter has been evaluated and fortunately is free of any scary particles, the next thing we're gonna go over is sending your oil sample off for analysis. And when we get back, we're gonna go over just that. Hang with me, be right back. All right, so let's talk about oil analysis. Uh, this is a big one. So there are a number of companies out there that provide oil sample service so that you can get your oil evaluated. Probably the most well-known is Blackstone, and that is who I use, but there are a lot of companies out there that do this kind of work, and I have provided some links to some of those in the description box. Now, Blackstone will send you a free sample kit in order to send your sample to them. And to get one, you need to go to their website at blackstone-lab.com. Navigate to the About page, then click the link that reads Kit Request Form. Fill out all your shipping information and hit Submit. You'll receive your kit from Blackstone in a few days. And also on the Blackstone webpage, there is a a page to navigate to where you can fill out information about your aircraft. There's some special name for it, oil, aircraft, procedure form or something like that, but you'll find it if you look at the, uh, the web page, you'll find it. Anyway, there's a downloadable form there that you can fill out that you should also include with your oil sample when you send it off. When you obtain your oil sample, Blackstone recommends obtaining three ounces from the middle of the drain process. When you're ready to submit your sample, Follow the instructions for labeling and preparing the sample, sealing it and securing it inside the supplied shipping container. Finally, include the information slip downloaded from the site and insert that into the supplied prepaid return mailing package. Seal the mailer and send it via USPS. 
All right, that pretty much covers the oil sample. When we come back, we're gonna go over very touchy subject, choosing your oil. And I almost dread this one, so I think I need a break. You probably do too. So anyway, quick break, we'll be right back. Okay, oil, this is a big one. This is a lot to say. I'm gonna to try to compact as much as I can. Now, oil is just one of those things that is subject to a lot of controversy. There are a lot of opinions out there, like ashless dispersant versus straight mineral oil, uh, single grade versus multi-grade, uh, using an additive or not using an additive, and there's just a lot of opinions out there. And I kind of think of like oil as something like politics, you know, and it's just one of those things that there's a lot of opinions out there and who knows who's right. And it also like politics, probably the best way to keep the peace is to say as little about it as possible. So I'm gonna kind of keep it like that. However, uh, I ended up choosing Aeroshell 100 Plus. It is a single grade SA50 oil. And I also chose to use CamGuard in my oil application. Now, I did, include in the description box some information to help you make your choices. I provided some information direct from Lycoming that goes over their recommendations and also a link to Mike Bush, who if you're not familiar with him, he is a fantastic mechanic, aircraft mechanic, who has a great YouTube channel, wealth of knowledge. So I included a link uh, to a video that he did about oil selection. So I think that's about all I wanna say about oil. So let's get back to the hangar and finish this job. So let's get back to work. All right, so the first step is to install your oil filter. And in my opinion, the best way to start that is to prep your safety wire. The recommended OD of safety wire and specification for safety wire is stainless 20 thousandths. Now, if you have something slightly larger in diameter, that's fine, but I'm using 20 thousandths. Before you install the new filter, it's a good idea to get your safety wire prepped. Because the space inside the engine bay is a little obscured, I wanted to show you how this is done, not only on the actual airplane, but also by mocking up the filter on my bench vise in my shop. With the section of wire folded at the midpoint, a loose estimate of the wire needed is about 150% more than the length you want to span. Next, approximate the length of the twisted section by pulling the two halves of the wire to the termination point. When safety wire is wound, it doesn't lose much of its length from the winding. At the approximate termination point, overlap and cross the wire so that they stay fixed as you grasp them with the safety wire pliers. For 20 thousandths wire, wind the wire such that about 8 to 14 turns per inch are observed. Make a note on the filter case regarding the installation date and the observed tack time. In the description box, I've provided a link to the Tempest oil filter application database. There you'll find all the different types of filters available and find just the right one for your particular motor. The filter instruction on the filter case suggests not lubricating the mounting pad. As the filter instructions read, hand tighten the filter onto the mounting base. I find using a box-in wrench makes it a little bit easier to reach the filter. Lastly, tighten the filter to between 16 and 18 foot-pounds. Feed the safety wire through an anchor hole such that if the filter were inadvertently loosened, the rotation would cause increased tension from the safety wire as you see here. Overlap and cross the wires at least an inch or so away from the anchor hole, then clasp the pair of wires and twist just as you did before. Cut off any excess wire, then curl the loose end back onto itself so the sharp end doesn't end up cutting someone in the future. All right, so we're on the home stretch now. Remove the filler cap and dipstick, then fill the crankcase with between six and eight quarts of oil. Now eight is the limit, and in my opinion, it's probably too much. If you fill it with eight, you're probably just gonna ventilate a lot of oil into the cowling and create a huge mess. On the oil bottle, make sure to remove not only the cap, but the plastic retaining ring before inserting the bottle into the filler neck as you don't want a piece of plastic to end up in your oil pan. Now, if you choose to add cam guard, the recommended dilution ratio is one pint 
for every 10 quarts of oil. Since I added six quarts, I needed 6 tenths of a pint or 9.6 fluid ounces of CamGuard. To accomplish this, I poured out all but 9.6 ounces out of my CamGuard bottle and then emptied the contents into the filler net. Once you've added all the oil and additives, if you so chose, insert the dipstick and tighten it snugly. Next, remove the dipstick and check the oil level. This hash mark here is the six quart mark. So the oil level that I have is somewhat over that, which is approximately six and a half quarts with the additive. And finally, add your logbook entry, which in my case was overseen by my AP mechanic friend. And that's it. All right, so not a very difficult job. When you're done, put your cowling back on, check the engine for leaks, and just uh, that's pretty much it. Pretty simple job as long as you're authorized to do it. A couple things I want to mention. One is regarding oil analysis, there is a little bit of controversy associated with oil analysis, and I actually saw something recently where someone on Facebook, I follow some groups for people who are involved in general aviation, they sent a sample off to two separate labs. They got back two very disparate uh, oil results. So, you know, oil analysis is something that you may want to approach with just a little bit of skepticism. Maybe, you know, build up a library of your oil evaluations before you start making any kind of expensive choices like tearing into your motor. So, just, you know, just something I observed and something I just wanted to share with you just to keep in mind that a uh, little skepticism may be well placed when it comes to oil evaluation. So, that's about it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Now, go out and pick up some tools yourself to become the master of your garage.